Pokemon is inherently science-based. From the first generation, you meet up with a professor who sends you off to do some field work. And even in Legends Arceus, you go back in time to take the role of a field biologist, making note of when and where some species meet and how they behave. So, hello, you could call me Nordis, and I'm making a science-based creature collector. But in the past, I've had some designs that were variants of Pokemon. Now, of course, I cannot use any of these variations, as they are too close to that franchise, and the last thing I want is Nintendo on my butt. But in this four-part series, I will go over the roster of variants that I've had in the past. I won't have lineless art versions of these guys, because I don't intend on putting them in my project anymore. But I might revisit some of these concepts with some other designs in the future. In this first video out of four, unlike the other videos, I'll be talking about just one line. Because I made a variant of unknowns. If you don't remember, Unknown is Pokemon number 201 from the second generation, where there were floating eyeballs with appendages that kind of spell out into a letter of the Latin alphabet. People always mention how you have to be a top tier nerd to understand these letters, but honestly, if you just squint, you could kind of tell what they're saying. I just can't do the other way around where I need to remember what the letter B for an unknown. They also have punctuations, but I, I don't care. What I do care is that these unknowns are named after letters, yeah? So, what was my scientific spin on this mon? Amino acids. Every protein is made up of chains of amino acids. The DNA ends up having a copy of itself called the RNA, which ultimately tells the order of what amino acids go where in a chain to be later folded up into a protein. In eukaryotes like ourselves and plants and fungi, there are about 21 kinds of amino acids since we can find in our proteins. And these amino acids, man, they got long names like valine. Okay, that was a bad example. Uh, tryptophan. So they each also have one letter abbreviations because there are more letters in the Latin alphabet than there are amino acids. Let's go! But some of these amino acid names have the same first letters, like theuronine is already T. So tryptophan needs to be W. Yeah, that's, it's kind of random. And if you're studying biochem, you kind of need to know this. Why? Because each amino acid has their own properties and knowing them can help you engineer your own protein and make the world a better place. Hopefully by attaching little characters to these guys like these little unknowns, remembering these can get a little easier. Or not, I mean, I thought it was fun. So let's start with glycine, the simplest amino acid. All of these guys would be a fighting type because they make a protein. So all of these guys have this weird head shape. An amine on one end and a carboxyl group on the other, forming this bird with an open or closed beak depending on how you look at it. Remember that amino acids are arranged in a chain to make a protein? So the amine of one connects to the carboxyl of the other. Now these amino acids have side chains associated with them. Glycine is just a single hydrogen, so it's the smallest amino acid. Glycine being so small offers some flexibility when you're designing a new protein, because there's no extra side chain to worry about, there's no extra baggage. But everyone else has baggage, so let's start talking about those. Side chains can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, which means that they really like or are scared of water, respectively. So, hydrophobic side chains are kind of like oil, they don't mix well with other polar substances like water, and would rather want to be with other nonpolar groups, like themselves. For example, when a protein starts to fold, they might fold the nonpolar ones inward and polar ones outwards. So, let's get started with the nonpolar side chains. Alanine is a single carbon. Add a V-shape to that and you get valine. And if you wanted to add one more carbon before the V-shape, it's called leucine. And rearrange one of the carbons of leucine and you could get their isomer, isoleucine. The chunkier we get, the bulkier the protein gets. Now, we're going to add an aromatic ring to the alanine. Gosh, that's huge. A six carbon ring, oof. In the chem business, that's called a phenyl group. So this is called phenyl alanine. It's abbreviated with an F because P is taken by someone else. Slap on an OH and you get a tyrosine because tyro means cheese. They found this one in cheese. Uh, all right. If we go back to alanine and slap a big chunky indole, 
the heck is that? It's it's huge. It's two rings. It's like a mutated onion ring. Whoa. Apparently, the letter abbreviation of tryptophan is W because the molecule kind of looks like a W. I don't know. But I tried to represent the nitrogen on the ring with a spike. Now, there's one more hydrophobic side chain to talk about. Methionine. Jesse, pay attention. I, I, I can't do a Walter White voice, but... Methionine is important, Jesse. You can remember it because it has sulfur that's not exposed, Jesse. The exposed one is different, Jesse. The non-exposed sulfur one is methionine, Jesse. Listen, Jesse. Every single protein that your body makes, that every eukaryote makes, starts with this amino acid, Jesse. It starts with methionine. Do you understand, Jesse? It's the start codon. It. This is how amino acid chains start. They start by saying, here's methionine, and it starts the chain. By the way, the prefix methyl and other forms of it are actually pretty common in chemistry. It just means that one carbon is jutting out. Like, it's not even the psychoactive part of the drug. It just appears first in the name. We talked about non-polar side chains, so let's talk about polar ones. These guys love water. Might even say they're hydrophilic. So what kind of chemicals would like water? Well... Oxygen is kind of a telltale sign because oxygens are usually strong at pulling at those electrons that they make the electron density uneven. That's what polar means. In water, those hydrogens are losing a lot to the oxygen that they're bonded with. When the electron densities are uneven, that's what makes the molecule polar or not. That's It, it has positive and negative poles. That's why it's polar. Anyways, if you add an oxygen to an alanine, you make serine. It comes from silk in Latin, like silk fabrics. Add a carbon next to that oxygen and you get threonine. Now, these aren't the first side chains that we saw with an oxygen, like tyrosine had an oxygen. Why isn't that polar? Well, honestly, compared to phenylalanine, tyrosine is more polar. But the aromatic ring, that onion ring, is just that much non-polar that overall, it's considered to be hydrophobic. Asparagine has a carbonyl and amide attached to the alanine, and sneak in one more carbon before you do so, and you get glutamine. They're both lettered after some ungodly associations, N and Q respectively. They legit ran out of letters and started going for ones that don't look like others, because apparently like U looks too much like V. Asparagus, no! But yeah, I sure hope that they don't substitute the amine with another oxygen. Depending on the pH of your surroundings, every subgroup on the amino acid is susceptible to lose or gain a proton. And we consider a physiological pH of 7.4, the pH of blood. Most of the side chains aren't charged one way or another in the pH of blood, except for the ones that I'll talk about now. The negatively charged ones are aspartic acid and glutamic acid, which basically look like asparagine and glutamine, but instead of that amine, they have an oxygen there. Just remember that asparagus is the shorter one and also comes first alphabetically, so it goes from D and then E. See, I used to represent lone oxygens as bulbs, but having two bulbs right next to each other, mm, yeah, I, I chickened out and made them spikes again. I'll be changing this up if I do redesign this for my custom project, but this is what I have for now. But we're not done with the charged side chains because what about the positively charged ones? Arginine goes one, two, three carbons down before this monstrous flail of nitrogens. It's R for arginine. And histidine has one of those rare five member rings studded with two nitrogens. Lastly, lysine side chain has four carbons before ending with an amine, the nitrogen. This one's kind of hard to remember because it's also abbreviated as K. Maybe you can see that K has four dots on it and it has four carbons before the nitrogen. A nice way of remembering is that negative charged ones only have electron-hungry oxygens on their side chains, while all the positive ones only have nitrogens. I mean, they also both have carbons in their side chains, but of course, everyone does. Also, not only did I give negative and positive signs for their eyes, but I also gave them minus and plus as abilities, respectively, instead of levitate, which is arguably even more useless. Let's go. All 
Alright, we got three left to go. We can do this. Remember how glycine is the simplest amino acid? Then proline might be the weirdest looking because their amino acid loops around and attacks itself. The amino side chain can still continue, but there's a massive kink in the chain. So proline is used in protein modeling whenever you want a huge bend in the protein. Now cysteine is another amino acid with a sulfur. And this big booty is quite important because when cysteines find each other, they can join their booties to form a strong disulfide bridge, potentially folding the whole protein into a completely different shape. See, in methionine, the sulfur is covered, but here they're exposed and, and could definitely reach out and form that bridge. And for the last one, often dubbed the 21st amino acid, is selenocysteine. You substitute the cysteine sulfur with a selenium. That came out of nowhere. That's even chonkier than sulfur. Does this make an ultra strong bridge? I mean, it's rare, but I guess it's possible. It's just another tool for bioengineers when making a protein. Also, they call selenocysteine the letter U, even though valine is V and they tried to avoid using U and I, I don't know, maybe it was inevitable. There are technically other amino acids. Heck, there are some that are completely artificially made. Because the RNA to protein conversion isn't exactly a one-to-one -one and some of the codes overlap. So I hope you've learned something today. And we're not done, you fool. I told you we're gonna talk about a line, not just one mon. That's right, these wretched things evolve. A protein isn't just an amino acid chain. It's a chain that's folded up. The chain can be called the primary structure, but those are folded up into secondary structures, which are common motifs you see in the folding process, namely alpha helixes and beta sheets. I'd imagine that if you put unknown in front of your party and go through one or two tunnels in a specific cave, one spiraling you up to an exit and the other one zigzagging your way out, as you come out the other side, after fighting through all the other unknowns in that path, your party leading unknown would evolve into a uni-own. Helix form or sheet form. One being offense based, other defensive. Do not joke about this design. Someone already beat you to it years ago and I haven't recovered since. Despite these guys being completely new designs, if I were to port this design over to my project, I'll also make them look different. And here's the thing, while I recognize that I cannot use regionals in my independent project, I might redesign these guys one day, as I can imagine a whole side quest based on them. But yeah, I just didn't have the time to redraw them, as there's a lot going on in my real life, unfortunately. Okay, I'm joking. Union doesn't evolve anymore, but proteins do have tertiary structures, where the coils and sheets fold up into the protein shape. But that's not all. Those tertiary structures can group up with other tertiary structures to form a quaternary structure, which is necessary for the protein clump to get their job done. Whew. We went through a lot today. So I must congratulate and thank you for reaching the end. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters for directly helping me in these times. This is part one out of four of my variant series, but if you want to check out my own designs, I got a whole playlist for that. But yeah, like and share the video to your friends. I'll still be here for my next video, which is about giving some Pokemon new science-themed evolutions. Alright, I'll see you around.